Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome back. We are about to start our next talk on Education 2.0, which will be delivered by Jose Somolinos, an e-learning professional from Spain, who has worked on projects in Spain and France in the recent years. He will talk to us about his view on the future of learning. Please welcome Jose on stage. Okay. Thank you very much, Ksenia, and thank you all of you. Tonight, if you are here gather, it's because we are going to talk about learning. I, it's a hot topic right now. And also, I'm going to tell you about uh, technology and the brain, of course, because the brain is us. First of all, I have to connect that. OK. And I want to present about, my, about, about myself. First, my company. I work in a, comp in a company in the north of France, in a city called Lille. And it's called e-learning solution. And as you can see, we do e-learning. Uh, I, I'm chief of the creative department. That is where we have the rainbows and all, all the magic things <laughs> that we do. Okay. Some of you, maybe you don't know what is e-learning. But e-learning is like normal learning with an E of, <laughs> of technology. <laughs> and we have skills and know-how that the companies want to provide to their employees. It's not to clients, it's only to employees. And, with, and they do it through technology, because it's cheaper, because it's, it's, it's more useful. And my company, for example, we have clients in, in France that they are leaders in their sector, like restaurant chains, fashion retail, supermarket, bar banking, and all, many others, many, many others. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Here is from a hottest, how to be uh, dressed and prepare. Here is uh, the color, color theory for a kitchen cellar. Here we have a beautiful design of a, module, a training module for stress. And here is to sell with a serial uh, chairs for, for children with a, with a video character. OK, and my experience, of course, if I'm here, is because I think I gather three different, three different uh, disciplines. Discipline. First, I studied engineering for three years. After I switched to advertising, that's what I like, what I love. And of course, all my life I've been doing graphic design. Since I'm, I have a computer, I started designing with Photoshop and everything. And uh, all, all of that allows me to do any learning that I think that is something different from what an educator could do, in my opinion, because it's like technology appealing, graphic design. It's like I, tr I, I try to do. The, all the PowerPoint, all the PowerPoint, all the training modules as visual as possible, you know. Then the phrase that I used to say when I, when I, say, when I explain what I'm doing in my company is tr I'm trying to make things easier. And that's what I'm trying to do to, with you tonight. I hope that you will understand everything. <laughs> First of all, when I talk about learning, I'm not talking only about e-learning in my company. I'm talking about learning in general in capital letters, because for me, learning is a universal process. You can see it could be a student, an employee, or even a self-teacher. They have different motivations, as you can see, but they have all the same brain. That's really important. First, we are gonna, I'm going to show you an example of something that I would like to treat that is really important. We, he, here we have one program that is called a Storyline. It's one of the top-level programs to create training modules. And you can add picture, you can add uh, interactive video, you can see the uncap, you know, like, but it, it may re remind you of something. It's PowerPoint, right? And it's, it's because at the beginning, it was a part of PowerPoint, it was just a plugin. And now, it's a different program. But what happens? That taking the example of PowerPoint, the problem is that you are constrained to the operational framework of PowerPoint. And uh, you can think, ah, it's not bad, but the problem is, and if I say problem, is because it's based, and this is the same uh, uh, PowerPoint in Windows XP, and of course it's the same that we had in Windows 95. And when you are constrained to that, you cannot think outside of that operational framework. Yes, your, your, your brain doesn't go out. For example, we cannot create one, uh, one mind map, one pre like this, because we are close to slide, 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 slide. And the major problem is that the, that technology is based in one of the 70s, 50s, is the same thing. Then we, are, we have the same rational thinking that we had before in the 50s. And now, 
they pro could we do better? I think so. But to do to do so, we need to get off of the beaten path. You know, to be able to think outside the box. Because if we are constrained in PowerPoint, we are going to have PowerPoint ideas. For that, it's an example of something that we are doing and we will have to change. And it's a sample that we are doing in learning. I'm going to show you four examples that will illustrate my point. The first is when we search information on the internet. First, we start with Wikipedia, after Google, you know, we start getting lost. Wikipedia, we have a text like that, there's a Facebook. So, uh, finally, we don't, we don't really find the information that we want easily because the information is too scattered. After this is uh, a <laughs> one module, awful module, that uh, we did a few months ago in my, in my company about banking. Banking, there used to be awful modules, really, training modules, because it used to be with a lot of charts, numbers, graphics, uh, it's awful. And this company forced us to force uh, employees to click in every button, listen every song, watch every video. It was awful. And, the, and the, it was like 45 minutes, 45 minutes of uh, training module, which is awful in a company that you cannot, you can, you cannot uh, force people to be sitting 45 minutes concentrated in a really, really detailed module like this when you have power, you, when you have a call, an email, someone invited you for a coffee, it's impossible. Then that's past. Or for, uh, for kids, you know, how many times have we heard grammar is, is boring or math is awful, it's difficult? No, they are not. The only thing, the only boring thing and the awful thing is the examples that the teachers use, not the math itself. I'm going to show you that, that after. And the last example, especially if you learn in, in, in Spain as me, exams, they were awful because you had to memorize information. You were not asked to use it and, and, and learn. You were asked to memorize dates and numbers and things. And after one week after, you forget everything. Okay. Then, as we... I, on this example, I could, I could name thousands of those, but all, 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 wants to, all wants to say the same thing. Something doesn't work, and we don't dare change it. Now, we know that those examples are wrong, but we don't change them. There is a moment, there is question to, it's time to question the status quo to improve the way we learn. That's one of the key messages of that presentation. And for that, what we have to, to do is to analyze the way we learn first. This is the beginning of everything. And here, when we study, imagine, this is the proportion of what we see. And the proportion of what we are uh, <laughs> there is, is a tiny bit. And for what we are aware of, there's only a tiny bit that we remember at the end, the day after. And from that part that we remember, there is only a tiny, 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 tiny bit that finally is what we understand. Then at the end, for all the things that we have read, seen, listened, everything, there is only one small part that even we can sit here, that's what we really understand. And our goal here is how to improve this proportion. Okay, if we're done, I'm gonna show you one tool that I use every day in my job and that I like. It's called ergonomics. Ergonomics is where the real world, the object that we, that we design, meet our, our, our body, the physical characteristic of our body. For example, we can measure the length of our fingers. Then we can adapt it and create the scissors of the length of our fingers. If we use a scissor for the right hand, it will be co completely different than a scissor for the left hand. They need to be redesigned to adapt to those features that we have. Then, some of you, you, you may think, probably we have the same for the brain, because the brain, they are different brains, they are different ca characteristics. And yeah, that's what we call cognitive ergonomics. And it's like to design process that they adapt to the characteristics of our brains. And that's what we are going to see now. As you can see, there are four steps 
what I call the four learning steps, the cycle of learning. And um, is what we see, what we perceive at the sense, after what we pass it to the filter of concentration, what we are able to save in our memory, and what we are able to say with in our own words. OK, I'm going to start by the beginning. The picture is worth a thousand words. I'm sure that you, all of you, you know that picture, all, all that uh, proverb, Chinese proverb. But is it true? I'm going to try to prove it with a simple example. I'll give you 15 seconds to read that. I'm going to drink water. OK. It's interesting, no, maybe it's a text, maybe you remember. But if I show you that, you will have it in a glance, like that, in a single glance. It's a picture that shows, that explains it one side, all, all the other texts. And I'm sure that you're going to remember that picture more than the, more than the text. Well, I think, or well, at least I hope that you will remember that picture tonight. And uh, if you have the text, we can see that may some of you, maybe you're not English native speakers. But here we are all, 100% of the population is visually native. And what's that we have to use more? More than words. Words are wrong. <laughs> not wrong, man. Almost. <laughs> then, why we are all visual? It's because in our evolution, the evolution of mankind, we have been, since we were animals, using visual communication. And it wasn't until 5,000 years ago when we, wrote, when we wrote the first word, the Sumerians. And it wasn't until last century, yesterday, really last century, when we became, we, when we had a rate of 70% of literacy in the world. That words, they are new tool for us. But pictures, they are old friends. OK, then what we have to remember for that first point is that we are visual animals. <laughs> That's really important. OK, once we have the visual content that we, have, we want to make enter into the brain, we, it has to pass through the filter of concentration. And so it's a phrase that I like is, don't bite off more than you can chew. It's because. Me, I used to compare it learning with uh, eating. You don't, you don't eat a pie all like that uh, uh, once, at once. You cut it in small pieces. And you, after you bite it, you know? But even if you bite it in small pieces, like that, there's a moment that your stomach gets full, you know? But with information, the same. We cannot read a book like that, uh, like Matrix. No, it's impossible now. What we need to do is to cut in small pieces, like, for example, a page of the book, and after, there's a moment that our brain says, oh, I'm full. I don't want to read more. And then you stop. And there, there are some techniques that they try to force the brain. No, eat more, eat more. No, no, no. Let the brain, the brain is like that. And use your knowledge about the brain. And I used to use the, I like to use the Pomodoro technique. Some of you may know. It's a, it's a way to concentrate, it to be really productive and really effective of your concentration. And here, for example, you, the technique is like uh, you do a list of tasks as you tasks that you want to accomplish. You put it, uh, you you do it during 25 minutes, one single task. After you stop five minutes, and after you keep going like that. But it's a good technique if you want to be concentrated on something. <laughs> it's for the picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And what is the benefit of having a short Attention span. Attention span is when you can read it here. It's the amount of time that a person can concentrate on a task without becoming distracted. Why we have that? Why we don't should force it and have a longer attention span? Because because we need that to be more creative. There there is some research saying that uh, children with attention deficit they tend to be more creative because creativity is not painting or drawing or making music. It's it's combining things that they already exist and making something new. If, and that's why kids, children with uh, these uh, problems, they do. They, they are more creative. Because they are able to change from one idea to another, 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 and finally, they make something new. That's creativity. 
OK, then for the second point, the concentration point, we have concentration has limits. It is the idea that we have to keep in mind. OK. Now it's time to all the content that we have seen really concentrated and in a visual way, we have to save it in our brain. And for that, that Chinese pro I, lo I, I like uh, Chinese proverb, sorry. But that one is tell me I forget, show me I may remember, but involve me in, in I will understand. And that's really clever because when we are involved in something, when we do what, when we like what we do, we are we 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 keep it for us forever. I'm gonna show you with one example. Is a witness to words that moved nations. It's dead men faster, further. Worn by luminaries, visionaries, champions. It doesn't just tell time, it tells history. <laughs> okay. I love that advert. And I want to show you something about advertising because me, I, I studied advertising because, you know, Rolex for that, for that campaign, I'm sure that they spent millions of euros for the, for the production, for the rights of the pictures, and for the broadcasting. And if they use all those millions, it's because they, they are right over, over what they are doing. They, don't, they are not going to waste money like that. And the only key means that they, that they sell is emotion. We do it. They try to emotion you, and for that they use epic music. They they phone, they, they, they do a call for history, you know, for uh, glory, and and they show a lot of idols that you can identify with, because you say, ah, that I like it, that I like it. And if they use that, because it works, because if they want you to remember Rolex, then they choose to use emotion. What we don't do like that in in, in schooling, in learning, why we don't do that? Okay, this is the reason for why emotion is so important for our brain. It's because our brain has a capacity, it has a lim limited capacity. And if, we, if the brain has to, to see which, uh, which uh, events of our life are, are uh, more important than the others, the only way that brain has to differentiate those, to prior prioritize, is the motion. The emotion prioritizes information. Then, for example, a wedding day is uh, something really charged emotionally for you. Then your brain is going to re remember forever. Well, I hope. <laughs> no? Unless we change the, the wife, then we forget it. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, yes. <laughs> OK, after we have uh, something really uh, we we'll cook, it was, was really good, then we save it in the second floor. And after things like a normal day, a boring f movie, bah, forget it, bah, we don't want it here. Then, that's a good thing. What we have to remember for here that the memory needs emotion. That's really important. We forget that in the schooling. And the last step is explain it with your, in your own words. What are you reading? But it's true. You don't really understand something to you can explain to your grandmother. What I want to say? Uh, if we are not able to reconstruct ideas in our brain and take it out with our in our own words, it means that we did, we haven't understand that. For that, I show you one of the latest modules that we are producing right now. It's not just the release. It's for Virgin Mobile in France, and. Uh, and it's to, the, the purpose is to explain employees how to, how to present one new offer of VIP. But we turn the question the other way around, and we say, why we don't ask them what they have to say? And we ask them to prepare videos. Videos with a, for example, here is with a GoPro, with a phone, because the, most important is that they learn. And when they have to prepare, OK, tomorrow I have to make the video to send it to, to, send it to my colleagues, they are going to try to learn by themselves to do it better. And that's really important, because they learn after in the, in the module when they, when, they, when they see it, but also when they are doing, because they are involved. And you see, 
with almost zero budget, you have a, a, a module that it works perfectly. Uh, why is important learning for, uh, for teaching? Because right now, we have the internet, we have the phone all the time, we have the Google Glasses, and data and information doesn't work anymore. It's something that is from the past. Before, we, it was something cool. Ah, me, I know the dates of the first world. Who cares now? You can, you, you can search it on, on, the, on the internet. The most important is to how to use that information, how to combine it together to create something new. It's different between information data and, and knowledge and wisdom. Then the last key message that we have to keep here, that we have to learn by teaching. That's everything. And now we know the characteristic of the brain. We have measured the brain as we measure the, the fingers. And now it's time to create the scissors, the scissors that, of our brain, that they adapt to, to our brain. Before that, I want to talk about one example to show that technology is not a goal. Technology is only a tool to what we want to do. You know, I'm, I'm reading on, in, in, on the newspapers that there are schools forcing kids to buy an iPad, you know, or buying it, you know, like, oh, let's buy 400 iPads, uh, they're going to learn a lot. You have to have a plan for that first. And there is a case, really innovative that I like, and maybe you can say, oh, innovative, that's Sweden or, or Finland. No, innovation is everywhere. And there's one step here, in the Canary Island, where I'm from, in the island of Tenerife, there's one school doing, trying to do something better for kids, to teach them. They, they take a base that is the theory of multiple intelligences of Howard Gardner, that explains that there are seven intelligences, you can see it here, and they remove all the subjects. They don't have now one hour of math, one hour of grammar. No, they have all together. Because one person is all of that at the same time. And for that, they, take, they have what, what they call projects. I'm going to explain you one project. Here is a book. It's a girl called Kalima. That it was, um, it's, it's an immigrating uh, Moroccan girl going to Tenerife, crossing the Atlantic. And it's a book that the, the, the children had have to read. And they, they motivated the teachers, really, because to do that, you have to be really motivated. What they do is to break, they break down the story into pieces, and they find the exercise that they want to show to the kids to, to work on that. For example, in the book, there's a moment that the, the Kalima is uh, singing songs of, their, of her grandparents you know, in Morocco. Then they say, OK. Why, if you make your own song forever, then they create, they, they work on rhythm, they create on uh, rhymes, dance together, interpersonal because they do it in a group. In one single exercise, they work a lot of things at the same time. That's another example. Uh, they, at the same time, they learn the geog geography of Africa because they are involved in the story. They are reading the book, and at the same time, they are working with that content, and they are, it's really involving. And my, my favorite example is that. Now, normally in math, when the teacher says, OK, we are, we're going to set trigonometry. Say, OK, let's calculate the angle of, uh, who cares? Especially, especially kids, no, no one cares. Then, for example, what they did there, they say, OK, how big is Morocco? You know how big is Morocco? No, you don't know. You need to compare it with something that you know. And then what they did, it was, OK, you know, you know your island, Tenerife. You know how big it is. You know that it's one hour from here, one hour there. Then they were to Wikipedia. They take the measurements of the two countries, or the, or the island and the country. And the, the children there were asking for, for their, their selves the functions to calculate how big it was Morocco. And imagine kids asking for mathematical functions. Impossible. But they do, because they involve kids. They, they, they create exercise from them. It's not anymore the train going, one train leaves Barcelona, and uh, <laughs> you don't do it that anymore. <laughs> OK, that, that school is Colegio Los Ralejos Nazaret. And, uh, wait, wait, as you can see, <laughs> they use uh, a lot of technology. 
you know, like iPads and uh, projectors. And it's incredible how children of seven years old, they are able to do what I'm doing right now, but with their parents, explaining what they learn. But that's amazing. Why we are not doing all, all that thing now in every school in the planet? Because there is a barrier, of course. In that barrier, here I, I represent in a scale, in a scale of complexity. The way to represent content is what we use more or less in my company, you know? Like a raw text is like the equivalent of a PowerPoint. You know, it's like a, with a skull here. It's all awful. And on the, on the other side is a immersion, like 3D or interactivity when there's questions, you know, like game. And if you take the phrase that I used before, the proverb, I may mean, forget something I remember, but involve me, I understand. You can see that if you tell me with a PowerPoint, <laughs> Forget forever. If you show me how to do it with a with a with a picture, with a video, yeah, I may, may remember. But the best is to involve me with an interactivity, and for that we have the immersion in that. But the problem, as I said, is the money. Here we had the money, and before to do that it was really expensive to have a picture. You would need to take your picture by your own or buy it in a that database. That it was really expensive. But luckily now we have the power to change that. Because the images, illustration, video, all of that is accessible on the internet right now and really cheap. That is, is my next point when I'm going to explain you after. In the future, that's going to be even, even more, more cheaper. I like this one. <laughs> OK. Now, I'm going to talk about the available technology right now. I'm not talking about technology in the future that we, maybe we will, won't see. The thing that we have now. Because we're going to, to try to adapt those technologies that we use every day to the brain. And then, for example, if we, if we are visual, what we, if we are visual, what we have to do is to create visual concepts. It's logical, you know? If we, if we concentrate in a short attention span, then we have to concentrate on the essential. If we need emotion, we have to involve people. We have to involve them, the students. And if we're learning by teaching, then you have to share it and try to teach by your own. For example, how to create today visual concepts and without, if you are not a graphic designer? It's really easy. You have to go low cost or free pictures and icons. You go to Lenore Project, Honkat, iStock Soto. You say, oh, uh, you can find whatever you want for almost zero or one euro per picture, and you can try to translate the concept of your brain into visual images. For example, imagine that you say, OK, I need a dog living in France. How do you, how do I? You, you go to Fotolia, <laughs> and you find a dog living in France yeah. and for one euro. <laughs> OK, second part is that tables, they are not useful anymore. The Excel tables and data, no, no. What we have to do is to represent it. And for that, we have tools like Infogram, where you can upload or take the, the data that they use, and to, you can pr represent it in a visually way, but beautiful, really. That page is really worth it to see. And it's a tool that you can use to create, to, to work with your data, not only to sew, but for understanding yourself, the data. And also the, the Gutminer, Gutminer project of Professor Roslin. There is a really useful pr project to, to understand the world through uh, visual trends. I recommend you to search. I'm not going to explain here because it's too long, but uh, I recommend you to, to search that on the internet. Then we now have to present visual concepts. Then we have to concentrate on the essential. And uh, for that, we have tools that we use today, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. And you say, one tool. No, one uh, picture, one phrase, one idea is, is what they propose. But you can say, with one Twitter, you're not, not going to learn. One Twitter, no. But if you put together 20 Twitter, maybe you're going to learn. I'm going I'm to show you an example. One year ago, when I decided to study Chinese, I prepared a plan for almost every day, studying like that. It was in, and in, in the admin ground, 80 minutes of uh, flashcards. After doing the line of the restaurant, only uh, four minutes of a quiz in the phone. After listening to a podcast, doing that exercise at home. And if you see, 
there is only 18, 4, 20, 18. It's not that much, but if you put it together, it's one hour and a half almost. And the, the most important is that it's one hour and a half really efficient because your brain was concentrated 18 minutes. If you study one hour and a half like that, it's not going to be the same quality of learning. Then, you know how to present information through so Twitter or short, short thing like that. Then, you need to search the information easily. You use the semantic internet. This is the most futuristic thing that I'm going to talk about tonight. And for example, you know Siri? The Siri is, is a problem that you ask, okay, how is going to be the weather this weekend? And Siri replies, oh, it's going to be awful, as always. It's because uh, Siri treats information and replies you in a human way. It, it works with data, not with pages or with words. It works with raw data. And for that, I have, this is my best example I have. It's called Well From Alpha. Maybe some of you, you may know. There's a video. Wolfram Alpha is an amazing new tool that's available on the web. It's not a search engine, it's a computational knowledge engine. What does that mean? Well, imagine if you could collect the world's knowledge, things like facts, measurements, equations, history, trends, and calculations, and store them in a big box that's plugged into a brainy supercomputer. That's Wolfram Alpha. It combines knowledge with computational power to give you answers about nearly anything and everything you want to know. When you want to find out about something, such as the nutritional content of your breakfast, Wolfram Alpha is smart enough to understand what you're trying to figure out, and it uses its knowledge to compute the results. Whether you're trying to crack a crossword puzzle, discover scientific facts, or solve an advanced mathematical equation, Wolfram Alpha gives you instant access to expert knowledge whenever you need it. That's Wolfram Alpha in a nutshell. But you might be wondering, how is Wolfram Alpha different from Google? Well, Google searches the web, seeking out web pages that relate to what you typed. From there, for the most part, it's your job to find the information you need. Wolfram Alpha is different. It doesn't search for web pages. Instead, it computes exact answers using its vast and ever-expanding collection of knowledge and allows you to discover so much more. That's it. And I hope that we'll have that in future. I mean, in a short future because it's there, but now we have to apply it. Okay, next step, involve people. How to involve? Now there are two ways. It's my, my choice. The first is gamification. For example, there are two kinds of people. Those who doesn't like, who love to make a sport, and those like me, who is sport is not that, my, it's my cup of tea, it's not my cup of tea. Then I prefer to use things like that to motivate myself. This is a, what we call a sport band. It counts the steps that you give, all the steps that you go out, up, and it counts all of that and put it in a funny graphical way, and you share with your your colleagues or your friends, and you um, you compete with them and with yourself. Then that th that's motivating. I use it. I use it once and it works really good. I was working more than uh, than usual because it was like ah oh, I have to do more than yesterday, but not less than tomorrow. <laughs> okay, and customization. That's important. I'm going to show you first one of the quotations of Sir Ken Robinson, one uh, education specialist from Britain. And he said, human flourishing is not a mechanical process. It's an organic process. It's because we are organical machines. And if we are machines, we have to create the conditions. We have to create the conditions to let us grow as we need, you know, as a plant. And now we are in a system of education that is based <laughs> now it's a system of education that is based on standardization. It's like a, it's like um, agriculture, in, industrial agriculture. You know, one size fits all. One book for 50 million kids. Uh, it's not that. It's, we need to pass to something more like a garden. You know, where you have different plants with flower fruits, and you create the conditions for each of them, and after they grow, they give they, their best. That's what we have to create. And for that, we have tools, you know. Uh, one of the teachers in the school I mentioned of Tenerife, they use Office but to, to create the content for the kids. But it's not that useful, you know, because he has to create everything. He loses a lot of time. But there are a lot of programs, like, for example, Prezi, the one that I'm using tonight, or Storyline is the one that I told you about uh, e-learning at the beginning. You can create 
content for kids with tools and in a really easy way. And the last one is share it, because if you want to teach it, you have to be able to be able to upload information on the internet. You can do it like through Wikipedia or Google Drive. You can talk at the same time with people. For example, in my company, we have a wiki page for us, and we share all what we know about our company. Then when there is a new employee, an employee reads that wiki, and, he, and that person knows more about us, and he gets integrated easier. And a learning management system, what it is, is a platform, like all of those, multi is like moral education, and uh, it's a platform where you can create courses, upload courses, up, uh, create uh, users. The, the students, they can uh, subscribe to one, one course, something like that, you know? They can, you give the rates, something really complex. And then we have all of that. It's a lot of, lot of different tools that we have right now. And what we have to do is design a cognitive ergonomic learning software. For that, we have prepared a white, a blank canvas where we're going to place quickly because this is only one example. Because I choose different characteristics of the brain. If we choose the other, we can create more like this. It's, it's, it's only an exercise. I'm not going to present you the program that I'm going to sell, no. It's only one exercise. For example, First of all, it has, has to be a learning, learning management system because you need to create user, you need to, to upload your content and everything. After it has to be short micro content. Here I wrote the podcast, infographics, video, books. Hey, you see, there, it lasts only seven minutes. Mm. You have to have, all, of course, semantic internet, you know, the Wolfram Alpha that we saw. Uh, games, a lot of games, especially if we are with kids, but uh, who, who doesn't like to play, you know? Games all the time, gamification. We need to, 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 to compete with ourselves, to compete with the other, to, to learn. For example, if with the customization, the program could, be, for example, suggest you to prepare a lesson about the time, then give you the, the words, and you find information how to fill that of course, when you create the content, you have to have access, have access to a, from a, a database of pictures, icons, videos of what you want. And uh, icons, vector, infographic. You can create the data. You can use the data as you want, as you need. The program has to help you for that. Video. But of course, it has to be collaborative at the same time, working with people. That's the, that's the most important, you know, to be able to share your knowledge because it's the best way to learn. OK, and this is what I call a cognitive ergonomic learning. It's based on what we know about the brain, the technology that we have, and that's it. But the, if there is one, one idea that I would like to share with you tonight, and that you, we should really, every day, we should question what we do every day. There might be a, a better way to do it. Thank you very much. Now, if you have some questions, not too complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Do we have any questions? It's just a silly question, yeah, but it's about the gamification thing. Could you explain what gamification is? Gamification? Gamification is to add, no, to convert whatever you want in a game. For example, in that case, with uh, having a, a bracelet like that, you, you count the number of steps that you give. You know? Then that is, is a number that if you do more steps than your friend, you're playing with him. Then tomorrow I'm going to give more steps. But it could be in a language course. You know, there is a busu, I don't know what is it. More, more games you do, more points you have. And when you have more points, you can have access to different new things, or have medals, you know? It's, it's all, you can convert whatever you want to a game. I mean, not only on the internet, but in the real world, as I say, with the, with the, with the bracelets. Let's get my Anybody else? 
Any thoughts that you would like to share on the presentation that we just heard and saw? It was very rich visually. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to invite you to our next session, which starts at 9 o'clock, which will be delivered by the founders of Geek Girl Meetup. Thank you.